52. What comes to mind when you think of the number 52? Why is it so important? Among other things, 52 is twice the number of letters in the English alphabet, the number of weeks in a year, the number of cards in a deck, and the number of white keys on a piano. But 52 is also important for a more serious reason. According to researchers at Ohio State University, approximately 52% of those who are wrongfully convicted are considered criminals based on eyewitness testimony. Let's start with the following situation. You're an eyewitness, and you see the following criminal commit a crime. The criminal has escaped, for now. In the meantime, you go about your daily life, and you come to this TEDx event, and you listen to me talking about eyewitness testimony. The fallibility of and the emphasis on eyewitness testimony in criminal cases is alarming based solely on eyewitness testimony, whether that be identifying someone in a lineup, testifying in court, or recollecting criminal occurrences, around 200 Americans are made defendants every day. I find that this subject is one often overlooked. It affects so many people daily, yet is somehow still neglected. Eyewitnesses' memories, and therefore the lives of the suspects, are subject to change due to memory bias. Deviations in memory recall that either enhance or impair a person's ability to remember something by altering the memory itself. These reasons for inaccurate recollections pertain to neuroscience. Maybe some of you don't remember what you had for breakfast a few days ago, or your cousin's birthday, or the exact wording of your speech. And no, I'm most definitely not projecting here. You may be wondering, why is this? Or if you aren't, it doesn't matter, I'm telling you anyway. <laughs> we technically have a near unlimited amount of storage in our brains. We have trillions of neural pathways and synapses, as shown by these diagrams, that help us retain the information we process with our sensory organs. In the words of neurologist Dr. Madhukar Mohan, the human brain contains approximately 86 billion neurons with 120 trillion synapses. Considering that each synapse contains about 4.7 bits of information, the entire human brain is capable of storing up to 2.5 million gigabytes of information. That's more than we would ever need in a lifetime. However, brains aren't very adept at telling which memories are important. Most of our brain space is reserved for extreme situations, like when parts of the brain are damaged. Because of this, Memories and neural pathways that aren't frequently and periodically accessed or reinforced are often forgotten because the synapses that contain them are lost to a process called synaptic pruning. As the term implies, synapses and neural pathways that aren't regularly accessed are essentially thrown away because our brain believes that if we aren't using them, we don't need them. This is why you may not remember material that was on a test you took a few months ago or you can no longer play the instrumental piece that you had memorized a year ago. Another problem with the brain is that it is extremely unorganized. Think of your brain as a massive library of information, and think of your memories as books. Now, imagine that the books aren't neatly stacked on shelves and ordered alphabetically. Rather, they're scattered everywhere in no particular order, amassing precarious piles of paper. Hence, when you want to access a specific page of a specific book, you're often unable to retrieve it. Similarly, when you want to access a specific memory, you're often unable to do so. This, understandably, can make remembering certain things difficult. Yet another factor that affects the accuracy of memory recollection is time. If you haven't been exposed to something like a suspect's face for an extended period of time, your brain tends to throw it away, putting it in short-term memory instead of long-term memory where the important ones stay. In fact, we can put that to the test right now. Remember that criminal I showed you at the beginning? Let's see if you can identify him in a lineup of four suspects. I'd like you to raise your hand if you think the answer is A. How many of you think the criminal is B? How many of you think the criminal is C? And how many of you think D is the one who committed the crime? So those of you who raised your hands for A are wrong. 
those of you who raised your hands for B are also wrong. In fact, none of these four men were involved in the crime. <laughs> As you can see, none of four men's faces looks indifferentiable to that of the actual criminal. So why did those of you who raised your hands fall for the trap? Well, for three main reasons. First, because it's been a little while since you guys saw the criminal's face, and as aforementioned, the more time that has elapsed since you've seen something, the less likely you are to remember it. Second, because you only had about two seconds to process and memorize the criminal's face, and you're less likely to remember something if you'd only seen it for two seconds than if you had seen it for two minutes or two hours. Third, because I gave you all a false memory. By showing you four suspects who looked a little bit like the actual criminal, I caused your brains to try fitting a square peg into a circular hole. By this, I mean that because I implied that the real criminal was among the four suspects that I showed you, your brain believed that one of them had to be the real one. It then searched for the criminal who looked the most similar to the actual one you saw at the beginning, and once it came upon the correct one, you raised your hand. While I did only show you the criminal for about two seconds, this is often the case in crimes. Additionally, you all had the advantage of knowing this person was important. In a real-life scenario, an eyewitness doesn't usually expect a crime to be committed. They don't expect to have to remember the criminal's face, especially if the crime happens quickly enough that they don't even have time to process it. And this is the problem. We rely too much on this extremely unreliable source of information the brain of an unsuspecting bystander who happened to be caught in an unfortunate situation. Not only do we expect this person to remember an event that they weren't expecting to happen, but we expect their account to be accurate, which it almost never is. This issue is not localized to a distant or foreign issue. It, it's one that concerns us Americans, North Carolinians, and Durhamites often. In fact, according to the Justice Project by Williams College, there have been approximately 200 people exonerated by DNA evidence since 1989. Of these people, about 75% were convicted in the first place because of eyewitness testimony. As I said before, this pro problem is also localized in Durham. In Durham, suspect Daryl Anthony Howard was recently released after 24 years in prison. That's a long time, and it should come as no surprise then that the mental state of an innocent person deteriorates when they are placed in a terrible situation, like being confined to a concrete cell. As stated by the World Health Organization, there are factors in many prisons that have negative effects on mental health, including overcrowding, various forms of violence, enforced solitude, or conversely, lack of privacy, lack of meaningful activity, isolation from, so from social networks, and inadequate health services especially mental health services. Daryl Howard is only one of the many who are subjected to this unjustified punishment. That faulty eyewitness testimony and false evidence deducted 24 years from an innocent person's life shows that we need to do something about it. So what can we who are not directly involved in the judicial system do about it? Well, the biggest problem with regards to this issue is that not enough people know about the magnitude and the frequency of misidentification. So the first step we can take is telling more people. Doing so would inform listeners about this issue, why it happens, and how we can help with concrete steps. To anyone who does know someone involved in the criminal justice system, even if it's just in Durham, give them ideas for how to mitigate this issue. And to anyone who does have a say in court procedures regarding criminal cases, have police write out their reasons for suspecting a criminal prior to the lineup. And make this an institutionalized process. Ensure that the eyewitness gives their account as shortly after the offense as possible. Emphasize the use of eyewitness testimony not as an end-all be-all or determining factor, but rather as supporting evidence. And advocate for these changes whether that be at local government and city hall meetings or through nonprofit organizations working towards fixing the issue, such as the Equal Justice Initiative or the Criminal Law Reform Project, among many others. In doing so, we can educate, challenge, and inspire others. We can start small, locally, and fix the system little by little, piece by piece. Yes, 
It will take time, and it will take effort, and it will take adjustment and pain. But it will be worth it, and we will fix this. Little by little, piece by piece, together. Thank you.